Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I would like to welcome everyone who is on the call today uh, to the Public Humanities Hub Scholarship Speaker Series, co-hosted with the University of Victoria's Visual Storytelling and Graphic Art in Genocide and Human Rights Education. Uh, I am Andrea Webb, the co-director of the project and a faculty member in the Faculty of Education at UBC. With my colleagues, we welcome you to today's discussion. We want to begin by acknowledging that UBC is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Hunkamenum-speaking Musqueam people, land on which we are uninvited guests. We are grateful to be able to do this work here. And because today's panel is virtual, we invite attendees to acknowledge in the territories from which they are joining us. Today's panel, hosted by Esther in conversation with Kathy, Duncan, and Anthony, is the fifth in a series of six about the ethics of trauma-informed research that the Public Humanities Hub and UVic are sponsoring this year. The next event will be on November 2nd and will feature Shell Anderson, who will talk to us about human rights approaches to witnessing and testimony gathering. We hope that you can join us for the final event in this year's series. I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Matt, uh, at the University of Victoria. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Matt Huckalak, and I am the head of advanced research services at UVic Libraries. I would like to acknowledge that the University of Victoria is uh, on the ancestral lands of the Lugungwan, Songhees, and Esquimalt peoples, on whose territory this university stands, and the Lugungwan and Wasanic peoples, whose historical relationship with the land continue to this day. The University Libraries, an institution dedicated to memory, is built on once uh, that were once camas fields and meadows. The camas lily is a food and staple of community. The meadows provided a gathering point for Wasanic peoples to gather, trade, and be nourished. And I invite everyone to reflect on this history and may we all be equally nourished in the knowledge exchange we have today. Thank you all. And I hand it over to our moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, and apologies uh, to everyone for our frantic uh, trying to get us all on board here. Um, and here we are. Um, and thank you for giving us your time and attention for the next hour or so. It's certainly an honor to be here and to be involved with this project. So today you're going to hear journalists' perspectives. Uh, we're not strangers to trauma. We are often there as it happens or in its immediate aftermath. We are driven like all of you involved in the, in the project by a desire to seek truth and to report it through the authentic voices of the people at the heart of the story. Over my career, how we do that, considering whose truth and the pain it causes those who have experienced trauma to tell their stories has certainly evolved. And our three guests today have contributed greatly to those changes and to the practice and understanding of how we tell stories with integrity and honesty while minimizing harm to the people involved, including the journalists themselves. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to let you know that we will be mentioning acts of violence in passing and may reference other matters that some of you might find disturbing. And now to our participants. For 35 years, Kathy Gannon has covered Pakistan and Afghanistan for the Associated Press as a correspondent and until her recent retirement as bureau chief. In 2014, while covering preparations for the Afghan elections, she was seriously wounded when a police officer opened fire on her car, killing her friend and colleague, AP photographer Anja Niedringhaus, and, after, um, and gravely injuring her. After extensive surgeries, Kathy went back into the field, covering, amongst other things, so-called honor killings, sexual ab abuse in madrasas, and the Taliban's return to power. Kathy is, a, is the author of a book called I for Infidel and is, at, and is at work at another. She was a recent Joan Shorenstein Fellow at the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy, Harvard Kennedy School. She's a native of Timmins, Ontario, and now lives in Islamabad. Duncan McHugh is an award-winning CBC broadcaster and leading advocate for fostering the connections between journalism and Indigenous communities. 
This summer, he joined the faculty of Carleton University School of Journalism and Communication as an associate professor, specializing in Indigenous journalism and storytelling. He's also working on developing a program for a journalism school cer skills certificate delivered to in within in Indigenous communities. I'm sure many of you have seen and heard Duncan's work over on CBC over the last 25 years as host of Hell of a Story, correspondent on The National, and in the extraordinary eight-part podcast, Cooper Island, about residential schools. He's also developed an online resource, Reporting in Indigenous Communities, which inspired his latest work, a textbook entitled Decolonizing Journalism, A Guide to Reporting in Indigenous Communities. Mr. McHugh is Anishinaabe, a member of the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation in Southern Ontario. He will be creating one of the works for the Visual Storytelling and Graphic Art and Genocide and Human Rights Project. And finally, uh, Anthony Feinstein has done extensive studies of journalists in conflict situations. He's published a series of seminal studies exploring the psychological effects of conflict on journalists in covering the Balkans, Iraq, Mexico, Syria, Kenya, Iran, the refugee crisis in Europe, uh, the aftermath of 9-11, uh, the list goes on. He's also involved in uh, creating a documentary and is a winner of a Peabody Award. He currently consults to a number of news organizations, including the Globe and Mail, CNN, the New York Times, and Agence France Presse. If that isn't impressive enough, Dr. Feinstein is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto and past chair of the Medical Advisory Committee of the MS Society of Canada. He has done and continues to lead cutting edge research on multiple sclerosis. He's the author of at least half a dozen books, if by my count, and I did, on journalists and trauma, as well as his MS work. His latest offering, Moral Courage, will be released this fall. I haven't even listed all their awards and other accomplishments because, hey, that would just take the full hour. So I invite you to look in uh, the in the uh, in the chat on it because there will be links uh, so that you can find out about these uh, remarkable uh, people and the work that they continue to do. So we are in extraordinarily good company today, and I thank you all for participating. And now let's get in there and and have a chat. So Duncan and Kathy, first questions to you. Journalists are always seeking to get the, at the truth and they do want, I've used the word before, the authentic story. Can you talk about your own journeys in finding a way to connect with traumatized people and get that story while minimizing harm? Because I think more and more that's become, you know, what we what we try to, to think about in our work. Um, Kathy, I guess I'll start with you. Okay. Um, I, I think for me, um, it's really important to connect with the people that you're, you're um, um, doing the story about. Um, it's become increasingly um, uh, difficult for people to get to the field or, or, or um, with cutbacks in that, uh, increasing cutbacks have reduced the numbers of, of uh, reporters that are doing field work. And a lot of it is done from a distance. So I think for me, the real journey is to be there, to be on the ground, um, to connect with with those that you're 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 interviewing um, with empathy. I think is very very critical when you're when you're in the middle of a story and when you're in the middle of a, a difficult story, which many of them in conflict areas are. And um, so I think I would say it is critical that um, uh, people be on the ground, um, spend time um, uh, uh, with the people that they're they're interviewing, um, listen, um, and and go in with a uh, without a a set um, uh, uh, idea and and. Uh, view of the situation try and, and clear your mind so that you're hearing them you're not hearing this voice in your head that is telling you who these people are what they you know you're really listening um and i know that sounds simplistic but it's a real um skill and it's something that i think really needs developing and 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 develops uh with the more you do it and i think empathy is 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 critical in, in your your reporting and and being there being there is for me absolutely essential um, that's my my thoughts Duncan 
Yeah, I was Esther. It's a really interesting question that you ask about our personal journey because I, <laughs> uh, for me, uh, my my journey toward trauma informed storytelling is 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 based on so many personal mistakes. Um, it it it's it's based on on experiential learning and and things that I did wrong at the beginning of my career, and 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 it's hard for me to admit that in many ways. Uh, now, when I look back on the things that I did quite uh, sincerely and, 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 and trying to, trying to make a difference uh, early on in my career. Um, but uh, the, the truth of the matter is, is that, is that uh, there were, there were uh, people who were part of my stories who I inadvertently uh, harmed. And, 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 and I, and I look back on that now and think to myself, gosh, I wish that a that our industry uh, started to change the way that we uh, approach traumatic stories. And and I know that there's a movement afoot to do that, and that's part of what we're talking about today. But 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 more importantly, um, you know what what made me start to to look at my own behavior when I was going out into the field was this recognition and realization that there was a giant trust gap. Uh, between indigenous communities and indigenous people and the journalists who wanted to cover them. Um, and I, I would I would suggest that that perhaps one of the, the the primary reasons for that trust gap is the way that journalists treat uh, traumatic stories. Um, the typical practice for a journalist when they go out into a community is to want to cover stories where there are problems. That's what we do. We shine light in dark places. We try to, uh, you know, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That's that's part of the DNA of a journalist. And so it takes us into places where, of course, we are um, asking uh, difficult questions about difficult situations that that people have experienced, whether it's acute trauma at a at a at a tragic setting or whether it's historic trauma uh, that 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 looks looks into the past. Um, the challenge, of course, is that also part of a journalist's DNA is is this notion of editorial independence. This notion that that. Once a story has been gathered, it's ours to do with what we will. And that is where, in many ways, the tension lies when it comes to dealing with Indigenous communities who are very accustomed to having outsiders come into their into their traditional territories, into their communities, and take things away. Journalists are doing much the same thing and are not uh, showing the care and attention, the duty of care, that they should when it comes to to interviewing subjects about traumatic pasts. Thank you both, and and I, and I think that reflection. You know, at the moment, there are ten, literally tens of thousands of people have died in Libya, and uh, people have died in Morocco. And and I'm thinking about how we might have approached that. A gen, you know, 20 years ago or, or so. And it, it it seems like there are parallels, right? People are in situations where they have no control and we go in and want things. Would you approach something like that even differently now, Duncan, than you would have at the beginning of your career? What, what would be different? Just kind of get more concrete. Very much so. I mean, I, I think now uh, when and, and I haven't been to 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 war zones, but I think that that's part of the, the, the challenge in the in the conversation about trauma informed journalism. There has been discussion about trauma-informed journalism when it comes to war zones. There hasn't been when it comes to places like indigenous communities or climate crisis or in our own backyards when it comes to shootings, for example. There's been less less conversation about that. The normal day-to-day uh, -day crime coverage that we do. Would I do it differently? Absolutely. I mean, I think I think part of of what I now understand um, is that. My need to try to inform the public, uh, whether it's on the six o'clock news or or uh, whether it's it's through social media uh, on a on a live tweet, um, my need to inform the public has to be secondary to the to the the experience of people that have um, experienced tr uh, trauma, um, and and so I am much more aware now. Uh, of seeking full prior informed consent uh, and and trying to do uh, 
uh, a more fulsome job of explaining uh, what it is that someone is uh, agreeing to when they say yes, and I'm holding a microphone, uh, or there's a camera pointed at them. Um, I think that that journalists, um, and and it, and this is not for for it, it's not that 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 journalists are vultures uh, or 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 that we somehow are uncaring people. Quite the opposite. The the vast majority of my colleagues care deeply about about our subjects. But there's something baked in to the understanding that journalists have about how they gather material and what we can do with it afterwards um, that is not very appreciative of uh, a survivor uh, or someone who has experienced trauma and how that may impact them. So this may be a good point to turn to uh, Dr. Feinstein, who has looked at how it impacts them and, and how it impacts um uh, the journalists themselves. Uh, you've worked extensively, Anthony, with journalists around the world who witness and report trauma. Um, and you've talked about something called moral injury and vicarious and, and the notion of vicarious trauma, I think something we may be more, more familiar with. Can you explain those ideas and, and how they fit in with what Duncan and Kathy have, have described? Yeah, well, thank you for that. So when I started my work with journalists over 20 years back, um, it was almost um, by chance because I was running my multiple sclerosis research lab in clinical practice and a patient was referred to me with an unusual clinical presentation. It turned out to be a journalist and she'd been covering a famine in Africa and it got into a lot of emotional difficulty. And I remember saying to her, why had you not reached out for help? You know, you worked for a large organization, you had access to help. And she said to me, and remember this is 1999, she said to me, you don't understand my organization. She said, if I reach out for help, they're not going to send me back into the field. And I was kind of stunned by that attitude and thought, well, let me look a little further into this. And I did a literature search and found that there wasn't a single publication written on journalists and trauma. Um, and there was a huge literature on soldiers, veterans, you know, victims of assault, rape, police officers, etc., but nothing on journalists. And what I've come to see over the past, you know, 20 plus years, to put all my data into context, is that you know, journalists are resilient. The majority of journalists who do this kind of work do not get traumatized. But when you're dealing with difficult stories, when you're in war zones, revolutions, shootings, um, crime scenes, you are in a situation that you be, you're exposing yourself to a very high level of, of trauma. And um, being a journalist doesn't give you immunity. Like anybody else, there are going to be journalists who succumb to this. and um, that means that rates of conditions like post-traumatic stress disorder, for example, or major depression, are a lot higher in journalists who do this kind of work than you'd find in general population, for example. And so the last you know, 20 plus years has been a very, shown a very strong focus on things like PTSD and educating the profession about trauma. I should add that the kind of discussion that we're having here is not, ha is not being had in huge segments of the world. You know, so in countries that are very traumatized, very traumatized societies, there is no discussion on how journalists are affected by things. You know, so the work that we've done, even in places like Mexico, shows that there isn't a discussion. You know, in, in, in a country like Mexico, where there's an enormous amount of drug-related violence and journalists are suffering acutely, they're not having a discussion like this. So I think it's important to see that there's a global perspective over here where this, this particular topic just hasn't taken root. The whole question of moral injury is something that's much more recent in terms of journalists. Uh, let me just give you a quick definition of what I, what I consider moral injury to be, and I've, and I've borrowed from others. Um, this is a condition that can arise in response to witnessing or perpetrating or failing to prevent acts that transgress your own moral compass. So it can come about from acts of commission, things that you do or other people do, but also acts of omission, things that you fail to do in response to something that's considered morally egregious. And moral injury, unlike post-traumatic stress disorder or major depression, is not a mental illness. It's associated with some very uncomfortable emotions. Shame and guilt are the two cardinal emotions. And in journalists, our data show anger as well. And so when you're in situations that um, are potentially morally compromised, 
journalists can start experiencing these kinds of very uncomfortable emotions, which, by the way, can become the conduit to things like depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. And so, when I, you know, to circle back to what, what Duncan just said, um, my experience of working with journalists who cover, you know, very traumatic Indigenous stories is that moral injury is a big issue for these journalists because they are stepping into a situation that is morally fraught, in which you know terrible acts have been committed. They are working with communities who are deeply traumatized. The journalists are very distressed by what they're hearing, and they don't know how to deal with this distress. They don't know where it's coming from. And, and often they mean well, and they want to try and help their subjects, and they step out of their zone as journalists and start taking on other roles that make it even more complex for them. You know, they start taking on the role perhaps of a social worker or a mental health specialist because they are so uh, overwhelmed by what they've listened to. They want to try and help their subjects in a way that goes beyond journalism. And that becomes a very slippery slope for journalists because they're out of their comfort zone and they don't know what to do. You know, and no good deed goes unpunished and they end up um, aggravating immoral injury and having a sense of inadequacy and guilt that I should have done something you know, better, I should have done more to help. So it becomes a very, very difficult uh, work environment for them to navigate. I wonder if what Duncan and I think both Kat and Kat, Duncan said and Kathy alluded to, where you really use empathy and also give the people that you're whose story you're telling more control would that also would that not also aid the journalist or the storyteller in in feeling at least less would, would, could it mitigate those some of those feelings well absolutely i mean i think you have to approach these situations with great sensitivity um, um you really have to be careful of not you know re-traumatizing re the people that you're interviewing so yes i think that's a given and you have to learn how to do that and you have to have a skill set it teaches you how to do that. And also to you know, leave the person that you're interviewing with a sense of this has been somehow helpful to me in a way. But I think what's happened with some journalists is that they want to go beyond that. You know, how can I make this person feel better? And, and they can't. The, the trauma is too great. They don't have the skill set to do it. It's going to take very complex interventions to try and help those people. And journalists do not have that skill set. And so they end up on the slippery slope of wanting to do good, not doing good, and then it reflects on them and that magnifies their guilt and sense of failure. Oh, Duncan, I see you nodding. I'd like to see, does any of and, this- And I think, I think Kathy had her, I think Kathy had her Kathy hand up. So, so, so Kathy like and, Kathy Kathy and, and, and then I, I want to hear from both of you. Does this resonate <laughs> for you at all? Me? Kathy, oh. go ahead. Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that moral dilemma, I mean, everybody, goes through that you know I mean um yes journalists are in certain situations and so of course you know that desire to help but I guess what I wanted to say was about the openness of going into to speaking to people it's not really a given um in fact many people especially when they leave their country and go abroad take with them a narrative that, that is reflective of, of their their country, their governments there, and impose that on on those that they're they're then um, uh, uh, interviewing, and that's what I meant by that uh, empathy uh, being receptive to to the the um, person you're speaking to, to the environment you're in, and to learning from there, not going in with this, um, and it's a very difficult, and, th and this is where I think, is, especially in our, our schools, and our, it's so important as we're training journalists, uh, the next generation is that understanding that the narrative that you grew up with and who you are and how you perceive yourself is very important in how you're going to do your job and, and how you're going to approach um, uh, uh, your, the stories that you're doing and, and, and the people you're speaking with and to how to, how to teach yourself to be open to those you're speaking to and to the environment in which you are and, and to not allow the, the narrative and the, to, to be driving you and, and, and impacting how you're hearing what the, 
uh, um, people you're speaking to and the environment in which you are um, and, and how you're dealing with it. So I, I feel very strongly about that. And and so I guess, and, and that's why I, I just say it, it's, it's not a given. It's, it's a very, it's a very, um, it's, it's, uh, it's very important, particularly um, when you, you, uh, and, and not even when you leave your country, um, Duncan, as Duncan so uh, wonderfully said, in terms of how you're telling the stories and how you're going into these stories, it's it's so um, it's so important to be aware of of the environment in which you are, and then the people with whom you're speaking, and and have them and really listen to what they're saying, and 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 then try to reflect that in your storytelling. Anyway, I'm rambling. You go ahead, Duncan. <laughs> I, I want to pick up on something that Anthony was just saying uh, about skill sets. Um, and and this is something that 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 I literally now tell people um, that, that I'm interviewing. I'm not a mental health counselor. <laughs> I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a, 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 a psychotherapist. I don't have that skill set. And I can. Act, and, and if I if I tried, if I tried as 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 much as 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 I would like. To help in that regard, I, I am I am vastly out of out of my league when it comes to to offering uh, the kind of of care and counseling that some people may need. What I am is a storyteller, and and that's where the av- overlap comes is because I'm asking questions that that may overlap in in terms of the same questions that that counselor and psychologist and psychotherapist may be asking people, and I'm drawing I'm drawing out stories and past history. Uh, that that where where you know really strong emotions may may surface. The, the challenge, I guess, is is that if there's more awareness now about how that impacts us as storytellers, whether we're suffering vicarious trauma, as as it, which is what Anthony is talking about, there are ways that we can start to protect ourselves as journalists. You know, whether it is the the, the common kind of discussion that we have now about before, during, and after care. Um, you know, rather than than pulling out the the bottom drawer and going to the bottle after a hard interview, you know, I think we're more we've 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 got we've moved beyond that in in and we're more progressive and aware now about how journalists should be preparing themselves before, during, and after an interview. But but my worry here is is that if we're focused on the impacts upon the journalist of being in a traumatic experience that we're really, really missing an important element of this, which is what is the subject experiencing as a result of this journalistic inquiry and this journalistic process? And if we start, and and when I mentioned duty of care, I'm going to bring that back again. That is not a conversation that you hear in many journalistic circles, the whole notion of duty of care to a subject. We have, as part of our fundamental tenets of journalism, the, the, the notion of minimizing harm. But that is not the same as the duty of care that most medical health providers uh, incorporate into their practice. And I think we need to start thinking about the duty of care that we owe to our subjects journalistically, because if we started to have that kind of understanding of what we're engaged in by asking people questions about their past or about traumatic events, then we would start to build more collaborative relationships with the people that we're interviewing, more relationships of understanding, uh, relationships, period. Rather than a short, intense period of question and answer, we would have longstanding relationships with people that we're interviewing that would both a benefit the people we're interviewing but also benefit the journalists when it comes to their own uh, experience of the whole traumatic event it's a that's a, a challenging and interesting notion right because it's uh, I think we've moved beyond smash and grab, like you do the story, you move on, whether you do mentally or not, as Anthony says, sometimes you carry it with you. Um, what? So I think you've begun to describe what that duty of care looks like, that it's a, more of an ongoing relationship. Kathy, do you have any thoughts about what that duty of care may look like? And then Anthony, I'm going to turn to you both with your expertise about trauma, about the victim as much as the journalist, how that might work. So Kathy, yeah. over to you. And then yeah. I, I think, um, yeah, I've all these terms and everything that uh, I, I think that we, 
um, if we're doing our job in, in the way I see it, um, we're we're really focused on the person we're speaking to and the environment that we're in. It's not about us and it's not about uh, what can I do? How can I do this? How can I help? How can I? It should be really where you're re listening to um, the person with whom you're speaking, you're you're um, involved in the environment. And I agree with Duncan in terms of uh, longer, um, you know, longer conversations, which uh, regardless of, of the situation, you can, you can manage, you can, you can do. Um, I, I think this duty of care, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, our duty as, as reporters in my mind has, has been to step away from ourselves and, and, and be a part of, of, of the, to try to understand the, the story that we're doing, the, the environment that we're in, um, not to be taking ourselves into it, not to be, um, so I, when I go into something and, and, and into, uh, traumatic situations and people who've, who've suffered, um, I, I'm not, thinking what's my duty of care to them and maybe maybe it's it's just the the the, the term I'm 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 really wanting to understand what they're experiencing I'm really wanting to to communicate with them and and have them communicate with me and just to to listen and to 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 hear uh as best I can what they're uh thinking what they're feeling what they're um so I, I guess for me, if we're doing our our, our job as we should, um, and and we do we do have to increasingly uh, uh, address this, and 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 because we go into it with all our our narratives and our, and that's why I said earlier uh, in terms of how difficult this is, and because it sounds so simplistic, I feel like it's you know people yeah of course, but it's it's not. It's a very very. Uh, um, takes a great deal of training and skill and understanding how our narratives and our perceptions of ourselves impact how we 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 um, see others in, in the story. And so we have to understand that before we can leave it behind to to hear and listen, if that makes sense to you folks. It, it, and I guess, you know, I, I think what I'm hearing you say is that you know, especially in your case, well, you came from Canada, you've gone to this region. So that gap, that culture gap, is it important? Is it is is part of it when you say not having your own narrative, beginning to try to access and understand the cultural context you're working in? Is that what you mean? Yeah, to leave behind Timmins, and you know, I mean, it's obviously I'm I'm a product of of my my growing up. I'm a product of, but to really understand how much of a product, and and really to understand where we're coming from, and and yes, Afghanistan. I spent a great deal of time in Pakistan, but I've also was in the Middle East. I was in Lebanon, Yemen, and 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 each time, or embedded with the PKK, the the Kurdish uh, um, militant. Each time it was for me, it was just to 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 try to understand their thinking to, you know, um, so I, yes, it's the cultural. Of course, you have to 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 educate yourself and everything. But I think it's also an attitude and an understanding um that we don't uh, we're, we're, when we when we're teaching the next generation, we're not we're not exploring how much our own narrative, our own perceptions of ourselves impact how we, we listen, how we question, how we, so, um, and I, that's, a, that's something I feel very strongly about in terms of, uh, and, and I don't know that we're making a lot of progress, frankly, uh, uh, in terms of, of making that, that uh, um, uh, ed educating ourselves in that. Sorry. Anthony? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, how does one deal with moral injury in, in journalism, I think is a fascinating question. Um, I don't think it's for my profession to prescribe what journalists should and shouldn't do. I think, um, to pick up on some of the points that Duncan made, I, um, you know, one can look at one's involvement before, during and after covering a story, which I think is, is very important. But I think the part before is critically important. Before you go into a potentially traumatically difficult situation for you and of course the person that you're interviewing how do you prepare yourself because i think the better prepared you are the less likely you are to make mistakes that will hurt other people and also hurt yourself 
And so to have this detailed discussion amongst journalists, what can we do as a way of preparing ourselves to try and mitigate the chances of developing moral injury and thereby potentially making a difficult situation worse? And that's that's a difficult discussion. And I'm not sure there's going to be an easy answer to it. The notion of not wanting to do harm is absolutely pivotal, of course, and that, if that's a hallmark of medicine, and it goes, it goes all the way back to hypocrisy, and a physician do no harm. But it's, of course, it's applicable to journalists as well. So that's one thing, but then how might journalists help? And I think that's a very, that, that's, a, that's going to be a very nuanced um, response. What is your role as a journalist in this difficult situation? Yes, to get the story as best you can, um, but where does it end? Where does your help end? How far do you go to try and help people? How deep do you get in? What is the skill set that allows you to do this? I keep on coming back to this concern of, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. I've seen so many journalists wanting to help make mistakes in doing so and aggravating the situation. And so there needs to be a very detailed discussion amongst journalists in advance of going into difficult situations. How do we approach this? What should we be doing? How, how do we prepare? What are the pitfalls? What do we look at? What do people, what do our subjects expect from us? You know, you're going to be going into a situation where people are acutely traumatized. They haven't thought about these things. You know, you're arriving uh, at the worst moment in this person's life often. They're not thinking through these issues. Um, and so how do we, how do you manage your craft in a way that's as advantageous to these deeply traumatized people? And I think there needs to be a, much more of a discussion about this. If I could pick up on a couple of things that 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 uh, Kathy mentioned, I, I, I when when you when you describe empathy, um, I think most journalists have 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 a highly developed sense of of empathy. I mean, it's 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 it, to be a good journalist, you have to be an active listener, uh, and you have to to have curiosity, and you have to care. Um, I think I think part of the challenge lies in in when there are cultural differences. Um, that that sense of empathy may not be be acutely honed, <laughs> um, it, you know, it, or it may not be informed. Uh, I'll, I'll put it that way. If if you don't understand uh, where your subject is coming from, um, you there there may be cultural differences when it comes to your sense of empathy. Um, but but empathy isn't enough. Uh, I mean, empathy for what what your subject has experienced. Um, isn't isn't enough uh, when it comes to to being trauma informed and and this is why I'd I'd go back to the the the, the this important word of consent and and making sure that that uh, as as Anthony just pointed out most people um, aren't accustomed to dealing with journalists on a, on a daily basis and most and and many people that we go and speak with. Um, they're consenting because they have something important to share. They, 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 they themselves, you know, want to tell their story. Most people that that we that we we speak with, um, but I think we make lots of assumptions um, about what it means when someone finally says yes to an interview. We make a lot of assumptions about what they think they're engaged in. Um, what what they understand about what that process what what kinds of questions we may be asking what what how we will be um how we will be shaping their story where their story will 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 wind up and i and i think that most people have no idea um what the process of journalistic inquiry how that will impact them the, the 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 questions that we ask, the open-ended questions that we ask in an attempt to build a narrative are going to bring up feelings in a subject that, if managed well, can be very, I mean, it, it can be a cathartic process for people. I've experienced that, and I'm sure Kathy has as well. Sharing your story, talk therapy, that that can be a very beneficial process. Seeing your story in the news, that can be a very affirming process for uh, a victim of of trauma or a survivor of trauma um, but it can also be really really upsetting um, 
to 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 revisit that story or to see that story wind up being promoted over and over and over again for days and weeks and months. Um, and those are the kinds of things that I think we need to be thinking about when we talk about consent uh, and, and what people are consenting to, to when they share their story. And Kathy, in a way, you're in a, a very unique position uh, in that, you know, you have talked about your own trauma, which is not insignificant. You were gravely wounded. A, a, a friend and colleague lost their life. Um, and, you know, it, it's still I, I, I looked at articles about you. And, and and by the way, everyone should read Kathy's piece that she wrote at the end of her Shorenstein um uh, time as a fellow because it really addresses in a, in a very uh, it taught me a lot impactful way what we um, what we what what she has talked about in terms of uh, understanding your own assumptions because really and it's I, I highly recommend it um, but Kathy can you know can you talk a bit about how that may have uh, how it changed your perspective being both you know the the practitioner and the subject i guess and you know does is it harder to keep is it hard to keep talking about it it's 2014 it's 2023 you know it, it still comes up it's still part of who you are people still ask you about it as i am what what what's that like and and when when is it done well yeah um well first thank you very much on on, on the paper <laughs> um first um I, I don't mind talking about it at all. And as a matter of fact, I was very, um, uh, I, I consciously made an effort and, and wanted to talk about it. And, and in part, uh, because I think it's important to, and in part because it keeps Anya, my colleague who who died, you know, alive. And, and uh, um, but for me, um, the, the, uh, uh, what happened reinforced a lot of the, the things that I believe very strongly. Um, what happened, of course, was was horrific um, in so many ways, and and I don't at all take away from any of that. And it's taken uh, time with the surgeries, and I've I've had eighteen, and then you know, um, so so all of that took time. But for me, what was really important was first to go back to Afghanistan. Um, second was to decide whether I would really be able to do my job or would I be um, impacted by this and seeing Afghans and my environment differently. And I thought, if that's the case, then I, I will have to, to not do this job because um, uh, uh, then I wouldn't be able to to be I wouldn't be able to hear what people are saying uh, to me, because in my mind, I'd always be thinking, you know, looking at them and thinking, you know, am I asking the wrong question? Are they going to be upset? Is it, you know, um, they have weapons? Are they? So I had to be very comfortable that I was not looking at them differently, but also, and also I had to go back because um, it, it isn't just a saying that getting back on the horse. I mean, it is very important to, um, well, it was very important to me because Anya would never have accepted that would make a, a, a decide what what my future would be and so so for me it was very important to to make my decisions to to, to be to be in, in charge of that and so I had to go back um a long explanation but so when I went back um I really spent a lot of time interviewing and talking to people and and just seeing, um, I I like Afghanistan very much. I enjoy going there. I'm 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 very comfortable. I'm very at ease. And I I it had to be the same. I had to look at at Afghans the way I'm looking at you. I had to you know not have any sense of 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 what are they going to do to me? Would it, it had to not be about me? So. Um, and I'll just say, share this one incident. We were out in this part of Kabul and somebody comes over and he looks a little bit like he's, is he baking? Is he, and I'm thinking, oh, gee, I wonder, you know, but he's kind of dressed. And I'm just trying to figure out who that individual is. And I'm looking at the environment, not even thinking about anything else, but just the individual. And my colleague behind me, Amr Shah, who I love to death, um, the guy came up and yes, he was begging. And after he left, Amr Shah said to me, oh, you know, Kathy John, I worried, did he have a gun? Didn't he have a gun? never occurred to me. And that's not that I'm I'm cavalier. I don't take care of my circumstances or or, or understand my circumstances because I do and and I mitigate dangers and we mitigated every danger when we went there. But it was that I saw the individual. I didn't, it wasn't about me. It was about that person. And after I was doing interviews of victims of explosions and 
And I wanted so much to hear their story and I wanted so much to understand. So I think for me, it, it everything reinforced um, my, my sense of what it is we do as reporters um, and how important it is for us to be able to um, put ourselves uh, out of the story and 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 uh, um, want to tell their story and to hear their story. So I'm not sure if that just was a lot of rambling or if that got the point across. No, I think it, it, it's, uh, first of all, I think it shows enormous uh, bravery, frankly, but I think it reinforces something Duncan said at the outset too, which is it's really important to feel you have control. Mm. And one of the things about that, that I, it certainly took me also a long time to learn in this business was that, you know, when you go to talk to people, they, it, they, they need that and they need it. And the more, the more painful it is, the more that's important. And, and I agree with both of you, we have to do a better job teaching that to journalists that that, that somehow doesn't compromise your independence, uh, yeah. but it reinforces your humanity to an extent. Um, Duncan, I know that I'm going to shift gears a little bit. We're we're about four minutes away from a point where if you have Q&A uh, questions for any of our panelists, uh, we'd love to hear from you. We're going to devote uh, some time to, to that. Um, so please put your questions uh, in the, in the uh, Q&A and we will try to get them to the panelists. But Duncan, I also wanted to acknowledge, I, I mentioned at the beginning that you are actually going to be part of this visual storytelling project and I know it's early days but can you talk a little bit about why you decided to get involved and what you hope to accomplish with it in terms of of telling about trauma in a way that will be very helpful yeah uh, and and I'm glad you asked about it because it's it's a it's a it's a fantastic project um and 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 I'm I'm excited to be to be a small part of it um I was uh, approached uh, by by Charlotte, uh, who is um, uh, leading the this this uh, multinational uh, effort to uh, look at uh, genocide uh, through the lens of of um, graphic novels, um, and uh, and it is is it, it's impressive in its scope. Uh, started off uh, with three graphic novels uh, about uh, the Holocaust uh, from the perspective of survivors um, and uh, pairing them up with artists to share their story. Um, we've uh, the, the project has now moved on to to expand to other countries, uh, looking. Um, at Rwanda, for example, uh, I am part of uh, a group that will be looking at uh, stories from Turtle Island, um, and uh, I've been asked to to tell the story of uh, a residential school survivor. Um, and uh, to to me, it's it's incredibly exciting because uh, graphic novels are are uh, such a, a a visual and visceral way to to share stories uh in 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 ways that are that, that can be very accessible to people who uh don't have the time uh to read a five volume um royal commission report uh that that is thousands and thousands of pages um but we can begin to do human rights education uh to people who are are you know who like comic books <laughs> um but also of course um you know, and and certainly graphic novels are much more than just simple comic books. That's for sure. But but also, I think there's there are fabulous ways to reach younger audiences, um, and and that that style of uh, of art, uh, of communicating story, uh, is a tremendously appealing to 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 young adults and and even children. Um, and so I, it, it's just a delight um, that I'm, I'm I'm in the early stages right now uh, of um, working with a, a survivor and and pairing them with an artist and and we'll be we'll be putting together that story in the in the months and and uh, ahead. We look forward to uh, to uh, seeing the results of it. I, I've no doubt it will be. Uh, I, I should also mention that I also um, had a career at CBC and had the good fortune of of learning from Duncan um, more than once, uh, uh, you know, and uh, and I'm very grateful for the work he's done. So we look forward to seeing uh, what what you uh, what you develop. 
with the, in conjunction with the person. And Anthony, I want to turn to you one more time too to ask, you know, you've alluded to what what some of the struggles can be for practitioners. Um, I'd like you to spend a few minutes uh, uh, talking about what some of the best practices might be. I think you talked a little bit about the before stuff um, that mitigates harm for practitioners and in what way that might also impact the way they approach the people they deal with and understanding their trauma. Right, so I think there's no substitute for good education. People have to be educated on this. Journalists have to be educated on it. There needs to be a discussion about the topics that we've touched on over here. I think when you are informed about these issues, you're going to be less likely to make mistakes and you will approach your work in a very different way. I've been struck over the years by a almost a profound naivety amongst certain journalists when it comes to their own emotional health, um, not understanding where their own feelings and emotions are coming from. Um, they're very skilled in the art of working as a journalist, but when it comes to you know self-reflection and understanding why they feel so so poor emotionally, they they just have been clueless. And I think uh, one way to break through that is to educate people about you know what is trauma. We use the word trauma so loosely, you know, we just throw it out there. Um, but what is you know deep-seated psychological trauma? What is it about? What are the symptoms? How how might you be affected by it? So I think you've really got to start with education. I think the essential approach to dealing with moral injury is going to be through education, of educating people in advance about what are the risks over here. And then, you know, coming back to what's been spoken about here, both by Kathy and Duncan, the absolute essential fact that you've got to be culturally sensitive. It's so important. There's a wonderful book out there called The Americanization of Psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And it's a great book because there's a notion that, you know, we can take an American model and go everywhere in the world and apply it. We can't. It doesn't fit. That model doesn't fit in so many different societies. And so just as my profession has to be so culturally sensitive about mental health issues, journalists have to have that same sensitivity in dealing with other cultures because your, your um, constructs are not going to fit. And so, you know, before you even do your work, learn about the people whom you're reporting on, understand the cultural nuances that are so pivotal to the way people lead their lives. Because if you don't, you're going to blunder in with the best of good intention in the process makes situations worse. So I think, you know, it comes down to education, education, education. It can make a real difference to um, how we look after ourselves, but also how we deal with other people who've been deeply traumatized. Duncan, are you know, and Kathy, I don't know how much teaching you've done other than at the Shorenstein, but Duncan, I know you you're now at Carleton. You you've also lectured elsewhere. Are is there a, a beginning to be a, a understanding of this? Is it getting into the curriculum uh, in J schools as as much as uh, you're aware of? Slowly but surely. Uh, I mean, I, so so my my colleague here uh, at Carleton University, Matthew Pearson, uh, teaches a full course on trauma informed journalism, uh, and and uh, you know that that is groundbreaking. Um, and I and I know from my work at, at at TMU and and UBC that other other schools are starting to uh, incorporate that into their curriculum. Uh, because students are asking for it. I mean, this uh, what we're seeing here is a generational divide, and 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 um, you know, students now uh, are far more aware uh, of of mental health issues than than our generation ever was, uh, and and they are saying, you know, this is impacting me, and and the old school journalists amongst us are have been slow to to um, to respond, but but. Uh, professors like Matthew Pearson uh, are are listening and and saying we can do a better job in a safe space like a journalism school of starting to to uh, let journalists know um, uh, 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 journalism students know what what they're going to be experiencing. Um, and, and I'm sorry, I, the, the cross, the former cross country checkup host in me is is looking at the the question and answers. So so, <laughs> I, I, I would, there, was, there was someone I that, promise that we'll get there in a second. The, Kathy, the, 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 just any the, the, last but, word. No no no, but but so, someone <laughs> asked, you know, what kind of training is there? Yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. newsrooms right now. Yeah. And and Matthew Pearson and um, Dave Seiglins from the CBC gathered a group of journalists uh, not that long ago, where I, where I first met Anthony actually. 
and 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 I'm I I hate to 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 let people know, but but the, the, the truth of the matter is there is not much. Uh, I mean, when you heard forty five of the, the the most caring and best journalists in the country uh, talk for two days about the situation out there in the newsrooms, there's lots of talk uh, about from from our higher ups uh, about the need for for proper care. But but the truth of the matter is is that not a lot has changed, um, and and uh, there's there's lip service paid to mental health and the need for care, but but the reality is is that the expectations are still extremely high, and the cultural uh, values of the newsroom still uh, you know aren't putting uh, self care uh, as a very high priority. Right. Right. And um, Kathy, I know you, and you're you're you've really talked about the point of just educating journalists to understand that they have to put aside their own filters and really listen. Are you seeing any change in that direction? And then, yes, Duncan did answer the, the question around um, how much me- focus on mental health is, is there in newsrooms? I'm going to let you do that and then we're going to move on because there are a bunch of questions. Yeah, I'll just really quickly address that. I don't think so. And I guess what what for me, which is really important, and it sort of also speaks to what um, Dr. Feinstein has been talking about uh, as well, is that I for, for me, it's it, what we're not really um, or I haven't seen um, a great deal of is really looking not just at the cultures that we we will will interact with and education in that way but the education about ourselves and where we're coming from and our perceptions and our narratives and our and how that um influences how we do our job and how we do our 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 work and 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 that's a really deep uh, uh um, it's 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 such a critical area but i don't really think that we 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 assume we make a lot of assumptions about um uh, our narratives and where we're coming from and our sense of yes we want to tell the truth we want to speak truth to power blah blah you know all of this and we we, we and 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 in fact we we really have to and i think it's very it's critical that that reporters um my generation previous and, and new generation really try to understand where they're coming from and, and about themselves and their narratives and their place in the, in their society and their place in the world and then how they see the rest of the world and then have those discussions and 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 see where where they they are where they work, where they don't work, where where you're you're making assumptions based on 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 a narrative that that has absolutely no uh, reality on the, on the ground. I mean, there's just a a, a whole I think um, area of of teaching or or um, understanding that hasn't received the attention. I'm sure it does get some. I just don't think has received the attention that it 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 needs in my mind. Right. Um, thank you, Kathy. I'm, I am going to move to try to answer some of these questions. I want to be respectful of time. The advertised end of this is 1.15. I'm told we can go a little bit longer, but I know the panelists are busy and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So Dr. Feinstein, uh, some people have asked, how do you know um, that, that, uh, that, what are the signs that it's becoming a little bit too much? Um, what what would be the indicators of that? So, you know, we've got a very large data set now of over 1,000 frontline journalists with lots of behavioral data. And I've come to the conclusion that there isn't a journalist who does this difficult work who doesn't have a symptom of something. In other words, a traumatic memory of something or something that's upsetting. We all, you know, you, you remember those things. That's part of your pool of memory. But those symptoms by themselves are not necessarily clinically significant. There are a couple of warning signs that you've got to watch out for. When your emotions intrude into your work and prevent you from doing your work, that's a red line that's crossed. When your emotions intrude into your relationships and start harming your relationships, that's another red line that's crossed. And that's when you should reach out for therapy. You know, if you've got the occasional nightmare or the occasional traumatic dream, I don't want to minimize that, but that's the sum total of your your symptoms, you know, those things are actually quite common and I don't want to pathologize them. They just come with the nature of the work that you do. But when symptoms start having a practical effect on how you lead your life, when they impair your occupation and your social life, 
then absolutely you need to reach out for help. And my message to journalists is this, you don't necessarily have to wait to cross that line. You know, if you feel yourself getting into some emotional difficulty or you're uncertain about it, get a quick checkup. You know, I'd say, you know, we go and see our GPs once a year to have our blood pressure taken and our cholesterol monitored. We even take our car into the garage once a year to have the tire pressure in the oil. You know? So for goodness sake, why not see someone once a year for a quick psychological checkup to see how you're doing? It can be done very quickly and you can find out where you stand psychologically. So, you know, being proactive can also make a big difference. Thank you. So I have two sort of craft related questions, Kathy and Duncan. I, if one of you want to jump in. Uh, I'm trying to synthesize as much as I can on the fly here, Duncan, with your cross country experience, you're probably way faster at this than me. Uh, so jump in if there's anything you see you really want to address. But in, I, I, as a practitioner, I find interesting, and Bernard um, said that there's a thorny, thorny, thorny area of, around uh, mortal, mor moral injury and duty of care. And we're looking for your ideas, panelists. Uh, and I think some more the, the practitioners here. Um, it's, you, she says part of our duty is to faithfully represent people and the and their context that Kathy stresses. That often means shepherding it through many layers of editing, framing by people not on the scene. Those are the editors and 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 bosses, I guess, back uh, back home in their safe beds. Uh, sometimes it gets twisted along the way, a big source of moral injury. Uh, very hard to explain to those layers of industry how this affects the journalism, mental health of journalists on the ground. And can we? How do we deal with that? The fact that you're not you're not in complete control yourself when you send your material back. Those are huge issues, and 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 part of that is is uh, is why these are internal battles for journalists to 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 fight as well. Which which you know you're fighting your assignment editor who has given you a very short period of time and doesn't give you the time to sit down and 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 talk with people afterwards to 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 make sure that the experience was fine with them you're fighting with the headline writer uh who is looking for the juiciest grabbiest headline that will get the most amount of eyeballs you're fighting with the social media uh people who have their own needs when it comes to how that post uh is going to attract the most uh the most set of likes that will then promote that fantastic story that the newsroom has invested so much time in you don't have control of those things and they they have a different set of needs uh, or understandings uh, about how a story narrative should be shaped. And 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 I'm, I'll bring it back to to um, to the, my experience and expertise, which is in indigenous coverage. This is why it's so important. I can do all the work that I the uh, the, the the hard effort of of being trauma informed in the field and building relations with the people and the community that I'm working in. But if my team, if my socials uh, pr promotion team, if the digital team, if the the all of those the the, the senior producers don't have the same appreciation and understanding of the relationships that we've built with the community. Um, then, then harms can be can can be perpetrated on the very story that you've spent all this time trying to 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 build relationships with. Which is why, at CBC, for example, we realized you know several years ago that it was important that we offer cultural competency training. Uh, and I believe that we're the only media. The CBC is the only media organization in the country right now that that offers cultural competency training when it comes to indigenous issues on a regular basis. Because it's important that the whole team understands, uh, you know, the responsibility that they have when it comes to to uh, to the stories that that we're putting out there, and and these are the kinds of of things, you know. Okay, can can we take a little bit more time uh, when it comes to our social posts and make sure that we run it past. Uh, someone on the the indigenous team with regard to the language that we're using and make sure that it's all, uh, you know, uh, passed through the language guide, um, you know, things like that. Those, those, those are the kinds of, of, of steps that we, that we need to take. Kathy, do you want to add anything? Um, no, I think Duncan really covered it. I think there is increasing, hi Anne, there is increasing um, uh, understanding, I think, among our editors and, and as our newsrooms and, and organizations have become 
more diverse. It's taken us so long and we still have so far to go, of course. I think there is a, a, that 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 concern of going back to the reporter, trying to make sure that the reporter is, you know, the, the editing process that you, you're interactive with them. But I think it still has a long way to go. But uh, and it is it's it's incredibly frustrating and as Duncan says all that work that you put into really making those connections and everything can can easily be 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 hurt um I I think we still do have a, an incredible way to go but I think we're at least sort of recognizing the need to be uh, more uh, aware so that's that's something I think um in the right direction Yes, thank you. I'm and, I, and I'm listening to you and trying to. There's some great questions. I think um, without much guidance from um, anyone else, I'm going to say I'm going to ask this last one. Um, if Duncan or Kathy, if anything, or Anthony, you've seen anything you really want to respond to, please do. But I'm going to ask each of you for a short answer to this question because I think it's practical and useful for people. Starting with you, Anthony, what resources would you recommend for people who are starting their journey toward trauma-informed and inclusive storytelling? I think, once again, to educate yourself. There's some good material out there for you to read. There are a number of books written on the topic now of emotions and, and journalism. Um, so read them. Um, you can go into websites and find some interesting information as well. The you know, Canadian uh, Forum for Violence Trauma has got a there's some good information, good material. There's the Dart Center where you can find, you know, information. So there, there is material out there. I think it's very important. And if I could just respond finally to one point made by my colleagues, I think that if you have this discussion that we've had today without bringing in editors, you're doomed to fail. Mm -hmm. That the kinds of thoughts and attitudes that we express today have to permeate a newsroom from the very top down. Because when we developed recently the Toronto Moral Injury Scale for Journalists, this was a message that we got very clearly that um, journalists perceive editors making mistakes that have moral consequences. And so we can talk about this, but basically, you know, I think, you know, you, you're preaching to the choir. I think we really need to have a much more inclusive uh, journalistic uh, perspective over here. Otherwise, this is not going to go anywhere. Kathy, what, would, what resources would you recommend for people starting on this journey? You're muted, Kathy. Oops. Sorry, yeah, yeah sorry. Right. Um, yeah, um, I, I have a lot of uh, mixed feelings on this journey and 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 resources. There, there certainly, as Dr. Feinstein says, there 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 are resources out there. Um, I think that um, uh, isolating it to to uh, trauma itself, I think there's a lot of things that personally we we have to. Uh, think about in terms of um, how we do our job and how we perceive ourselves and how we perceive the stories that we're telling and and uh, so I think it's it, there there definitely are resources I think you can um, spend time talking to people that have been in the these environments that are 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 working on these uh, these issues um, yeah I. I I, I think it's very important it's, it's to, uh, to to include our editors in that. I I think that um, we 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 have to also realize that that we are really not the story. Um, although it's very important that we 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 try to understand where we're coming from. But I I think uh, and there are plenty of resources out there to talk to people um, about if you're interested. Duncan. And Esther, uh, you you mentioned at the beginning that that I have this textbook decolonizing journalism. When, what I realized, uh, I, I put together a guide for reporting in Indigenous communities ten years ago, and I wrote nothing about trauma informed reporting in that. And and I realized that was a was a was a huge gap. <laughs> you know, I, I had my own blinders on, and uh, and and I realized that that was something that was missing. So when I was uh, researching uh, on on you know ways to to report in a in an ethical and trauma informed manner in indigenous communities, um, absolutely the Dart Center uh, you know is is a, is a first stop for for any journalist who is is doing work in this in this um, in this area. Uh, Joe Healy uh, has some fantastic material. She's a, a BBC a former BBC journalist who's written quite a bit about about uh, trauma informed journalism. Tamara Cherry. Uh, has a new book out called uh, The Trauma Beat, uh, uh, based on her experience in Toronto. Um, and and I'd, I'd urge people to look that up. Um, and 
because there are there there are as as Anthony said there there are plenty of resources uh, now for for journalists who want to 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 start to to explore um, you know how to do a better job. Thank you, and I I will add in a self serving way the Canadian but but also serving your interests uh, you you who are participating today the Canadian Journalism Forum on Violence and Trauma also has uh, aggregated a lot of. Um, information around trauma-informed reporting and self-care for journalists and so on. Um, we also have a, 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 a document called Mindset, which is about reporting on mental health and understanding the issues around that. Um, so there's a lot, there are lots of resources. There's some wonderful questions. I personally would love to have a discussion on what does consent really look like, but that would be another hour. So maybe we can do it another day. So I think I, I'm not quite sure how I'm supposed to wrap this up, but I will personally wrap it up and then throw it back to our wonderful organizers to thank you, Kathy, Duncan, and Anthony for your depth and insight and your humanity to the participants for their great questions. Sorry, we could not get to more of them. It's always the way. Um, and as I mentioned, the Canadian Journalism Forum on Violence and Trauma is proud to be in part of this project, of this series of, of webinars, as well as the the uh, the human rights part of this. Um, additional thanks to the folks at UBC who supported us today, even our, with our last minute panic, you came through. And of course, to Jennifer Souter and Charlotte, Charlotte Chiale for making all of this possible. And for that, I wish you um, a good day and thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Yeah. Thank you. Um, do join us for our next series. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about these webinar series, please visit the Public Humanities Hub at UBC. I thank all of our panelists today, again, on behalf of the Visual Storytelling Project, on behalf of the University of British Columbia and the University of Victoria. At the beginning, I mentioned that these were canvas fields that nourished the community. I have been certainly nourished by the conversation today. And I thank you to all of you for sharing your knowledge with us. And on that note, we say goodbye. And this video will be made available um, shortly with transcription. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.